Give to Barrett. Cut back over the middle of the 25 to the 20. Breaks a tackle to the 15. Stop, starts 10-5. Touchdown, Lions. Holy mackerel. Throws end zone. It is caught. What a play back there in the back of the end zone by TJ Hawkinson. You're listening to the One Pride Cast. Hello, welcome to week 18 in the NFL, the first ever week 18 around the league um, in the National Football League's history. Oh my gosh, we are making history. Final week of the season for the Detroit Lions. They are not playoff bound under head coach Dan Campbell, who's in his first year. So we are, we're wrapping things up a little bit here. Team reporter, Danny Rogers, and I'm joined by DetroitLions.com writer, Mike O'Hara, the legend, the icon who is joining me here on this Um, one. I mean, yeah, this is the last pride cast episode of the season. It's insane. Mike, we have done 18 of these. Uh, Now, how do you feel about doing 18 of them and how miserable have has, has it been taping these with me? It's been, I, I will tell you, Mike, it has been a blast. I have learned so many great nuggets from you. Um, you're, you're wise beyond your years and we are very thankful to have you on staff. I know that. Well, just a second, wise beyond my years is living in the cemetery across the street from me. Okay. I, you are, that's, I'm saying that, that's what I'm saying. You're incredibly wise. Uh, yeah. I I've, I've avoided the, I've avoided the bells. <laughs> yeah, no, that's we have I haven't heard the music yet, Danny. Oh, thank God. We hope you're here until 130 years old. But I mean, don't oh, get down right. on it. Like, come on. Like, come, Michael Hara, you are thriving. Just exactly. Anyway, let's let's stop talking about age, you know, and start talking sure. about, you know, some football. Okay, so Lions are coming off of a, a rough. We're gonna say rough week 17 in Seattle. I mean, the Seahawks are not your typical playoff making Seahawks. They missed the playoffs. They were looking for their sixth win of the entire season against the Lions. And Detroit kind of handed them a a big old win last Sunday in in week 17. The final score, 51 to 29. I hate saying that. That is uh, the the most points surrendered by this Lions team in a minute. It even ranks up there with the most points surrendered uh, in franchise history. It's a lot of points. We get it. So, Mike. First off, coming off week 17, where is this Lions team at with just one more game to go? Well, I think this, and I I think most people will will agree with this, people who follow the team, you know, fairly closely. uh, I think they're in better shape than their record would indicate. And a lot Mm -hmm. of teams, like everybody thinks that, I think. This is, I think it's legit. I really do. I think that they've done a lot of, not, not think, I know they've done a lot of good things to change the culture of this team, to change just a lot of things. And look, I've covered a lot of these, a lot of these Lions teams uh, over the years. And when you get to the last game, a lot of them, you you just can't wait for it to be over and really think, well, it's been over since whatever, November. I don't get that sense with this team at all. I don't get the feeling that that, that they're limping off into the sunset and I I don't even want to come back, you know? Uh, I think this team has, has, has developed something that will carry them uh, next year and the year beyond and the year beyond and the year beyond that. And a lot of it stems from the head coach, Dan Campbell. Uh, you talked to assist, for example, we interviewed today, Hugh Staley, assistant head coach, you know, uh, running backs coach, and really tremendous football player running yes, back yes. for 10 years in the National Football League. And he knows what it looks like. He knows what, what he's looking at and what it looks like when it's something good. And, and I asked him a question about that, about the buy-in that the players have got. Where does that come from? He said it's come, it's come from Dan Campbell. And I, he's not just saying that because that's his boss and all that. Goose will, or not Goose, Deuce will tell you what he thinks. And, and I, I think the players will agree with that. I think the people who have observed the team will, will agree with that. And, and I think it's really something to, to build on and to build with. Yeah, I agree. I think a foundation has certainly been laid here in Dan Campbell's first year. And you just mentioned what coach uh, Staley was saying about, about the head coach. And then Aaron Glenn, defensive coordinator in his press conferences this week, he had a really great soundbite about his head coach as well. He said, Dan Campbell has never wavered on who he is, what he's about. 
and what he stands for. And if you're in the office every day with Dan Campbell, like we are, we already knew all of these things. We know how even keel coaches, but we know how much energy he injects into this team and how much these players love playing for him. So that's nothing new. Um, on the outside, that might be a little bit harder to gather considering the record. And it must be so hard <laughs> getting through this season, but no, it, it, it's not, it hasn't been, it's been a really fun season. There's, there's, I think there's been something good in every game, really. And yes. you don't always get that all the time, especially like in a 51 29 game. But what I liked was, uh, first of all, a three and out to start the game defensively. And they go for it on fourth mm -hmm. and one and don't get it. But I like that. And, and one of the things that, that, that Campbell does, even when they're behind, people say, well, why is he calling timeout? Why is he going for it on fourth down? Because he wants the players to continue to compete. It's not yes. it's pretty yes. simple to me. He doesn't mm -hmm. want to say, okay, well, it's 51 to, 51 to whatever. Might as well make it 70. You know, why try? Well, no, you're never going to get anywhere that way. Never, never, never. And I think that, you know, Campbell, it's, uh, let me just give you a little anecdote real quickly. There was a, a Mike Singletary was a Hall of Fame linebacker for the Chicago Bears. When the Detroit Lions job came open in 2006, and I'm, Danny, I've never forgotten this. I was lucky enough to get his phone number. I talked to him three or four times, okay? And, and Singletary gave me a line once about being, because he'd never been a head coach before. And he said, being a head coach is not something you become, it's something you are. And somebody inside the building told me, says, hey, that thing you wrote about Singletary, it really resonated inside the building. And it resonated with me. I never forgot that. And he didn't get the job, of course. He went on to get, I think, the head coaching job in San Francisco and maybe a couple other places. But that's what Dan Campbell is. It's something he is. It's not something he's become. Now, look, there are parts of his life that have taken him in this direction. Number one, being born with that body he's got. Okay. He wasn't going to play tennis with that. He played football. He's got shoulders. I don't think he, he could stop traffic on the Ambassador Bridge. He stood in the middle lane. Okay. Nobody would be able to get around him. But took off your earphones for that one. Okay. Yeah, I, I need to hear you loud up there. I see everything. But, but first of all, football chose him and each by it. By, build and he chose football he was a tough guy i remember him here for th three seasons in detroit the last three active seasons as a player and he was as, as tough as they come and uh and also but he had the will and 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 the want to be successful and i think that's what's brought him here to detroit and were the reservations for him there always are first of all most people fail in football they don't succeed it's just just the mathematics of it it's against you going in. It's especially against you going into the situation he inherited here in Detroit with really just a dispirited, uh, a dispirited uh, roster, and even beyond that, the people in the building, people who are supposed to be your support, your you know support you, had just had enough of what they'd seen over the previous few years, and so he's built all of that, you know, with help, you know, with people who bought in. Sheila Hamp, uh, Sheila Ford Hamp, the principal owner, among them, and assistant coaches, people in the front office, general manager, Brad Holmes, all of that. But you've got to have the man, the front man to do it. And, and Dan Campbell has done that in one year. That's it's, what he's done is amazing. Mike, yeah, I think you know better than anyone, uh, more than most people about um, how good of a job in comparison that Dan Campbell is doing with a lot of perspective. I mean, the head coach who has, he was an interim coach for a second, okay? Comes in, is a head coach of the Detroit Lions, he starts calling his own plays and literally takes the play calling into his hands because it was not up to the level that he wanted it to be. Um, so he, he tries something completely new. It's not like he does it alone. He brings up a support staff like Ben Johnson, tight ends coach to help in the pass game coordinating. So he surrounded himself with people who could, who could help him. He was never in over his head. Um, I mean, people might think, okay, first year head coach, you've never played called plays. You might be in a little over your head, but he always put the right support staff around him to make sure that that didn't happen. And you've seen dividends pay off in terms of this offense. And, and we talk about it a lot, Mike, how much pressure he puts on the offense. Um, Cause he said, okay, defense can give up 51 points, but we have to answer. We have to, we have to um, go score for score with Seattle if we want a chance. So the offense has to always put them in it. So my my thing is, okay, he puts a lot of pressure on the offense. Um, 
And we're like, why, why, like, why not let the defense go in there and keep a team from scoring 51 points? But Dan Campbell's an offensive guy. He knew the ceiling of the offense that it could be better. Um, Q Amon Ross St. Brown, the rookie who is literally writing his name into history books as we speak with his play so far, but it's, it w- it's just amazing to see once Aaron Glenn and Dan Campbell have a defense that is healthy and they can go after guys that they really want to be a part of this franchise. I mean, granted you've got rookies like AJ Parker, Jerry Jacobs, who um, kind of just fell into their laps. And Undra- undrafted free yeah. agents. Yeah, sure. Yes. They fell into their laps. Um, so to see what they've done with the pieces that they have has been incredible. It's just, can you imagine once they can actually go in and sell the blueprint of this Detroit Lions team and show them what they did this past year and hey, we can compete, even though the roster probably isn't what we want it to be. It's just, yeah, I think the foundation has been laid. And I just don't think anyone can argue against that. No, I would agree with that. And, you know, if you look at it, the four linebackers who started the season on opening day as starters are all on injured reserve. Yes. Three are injured reserve. One's, one was released. Two starting cornerbacks are on injured reserve. And you go right down the roster now. Offensively, outside of the wide receivers and all that, pretty much, they stayed fairly healthy. Yes. Running backs, yeah. a couple of guys have been in and out. But that's, that's part of being a running back in the National Football League. Yep. It's hard to get through. 16, 17, 18 weeks unscathed, and then they certainly didn't do that. But but they built some depth at, 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 on the offensive line. I mean, good depth. Running back, yeah, I'd agree with that too. I think that that that's good there too. Uh, Jared Goff, I think uh, I think a turnaround right around week eight or nine or ten or somewhere in there, he started to become a guy who looked like he'd really been drafted first overall, and and carry carry the load, not just be. You know, look, you can be a game manager and be successful as a quarterback, but it's hard to be a winner. I think Jer- Jared Goff, I think, will now be more than just a two-year quarterback here in Detroit. I don't know that. That's just my projection. It's just, and I I, I can agree with you, um, Mike. It's just crazy because, you know, you read the Twitter. I have stopped reading a lot of social media. Trust me when I was I was put into this job for my own sake. But you see the comments, you see the Twitter comments, the belief in Jared Goff was not there until I would say week 12 after Cleveland. So after he had to sit out, um, was dealing with that oblique strain, let Tim Boyle go into Cleveland, not a lot happened. Plus it was Tim Boyle's first career start in the NFL. I think you can definitely argue that Goff having to sit out, lit a fire underneath him. Um, But then you also had, by that time it was week 12, you had players like Amon Ross St. Brown and the rookies really starting to step up and assume big roles on this team. So it's just crazy to me, just the criticism that golf got in the beginning of the season. Granted, the offense was not good to start the season. Um, but once golf really had that fire lit under him, Dan Campbell started, started calling plays. Ben Johnson took a more uh, important role in the pass game. And then you have, yeah, just unreal play by Amon Ross St. Brown. You had Jason Cabinda, who was catching touchdown passes. Like, what? The fullback? Um, you had Penny Sewell, who just kept continually being consistent. Um, so just a lot of young guys, a lot of guys who have been thrust into different positions really started to step up. So it, was, it, it has been awesome to see what this offense can look like in this first year of so much newness and change. And it, it'd be hard not to be excited about next season in my opinion, especially with the rise of Amon Ross St. Brown. Well, I think this too, and I think if you get uh, uh, TJ Hawkinson back healthy, you know, he's missed what, what's going to be five games when it's all said and done, yep. four games, five games, something like that, and get him back and, and play him just at a Pro Bowl level. He may not be all pro, but he's one, he'll be one of the top five or six tight ends in the league, and I think that's, you, know, you can you, you win with that. Uh I think you know another another year in the system as the system gets d- developed further will certainly help Jared Goff. I thought he was a little timid. I don't mean timid like personally or anything like that, but I mean just kind of nibbling at the edges with his throws. Throw it in there, okay? Come on, you got insurance. <laughs> Come on, throw it. <laughs> I think they played more to his strength, and then he played more to what they wanted. Combination of things. You know, you give me, I give you. I give you, you give me. And I think that's. Uh, 
it's sort of a relationship type of thing. And I think that uh, I think Jared, uh, I think Jared benefited by it. I think the offense benefited by it too. And I, but I said a two-year quarterback. Look, when he came here, it was part of the Matthew Stafford trade, and he was here for two years because he had a, a hefty two-year contract. I think he can be more than that now. I think he can be a, a quarterback that you can win with. And if and if I'm right and he's right and he develops the way I think he will, that certainly solves a big problem for you because if you don't have to go out and shop for a, a quarterback, that certainly changes your offseason plan. It really does. Now, yeah. who am I to say that the Detroit Lions look at it the same way I do? But I think we're pretty close on that one. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. And it's just weeks one through 10 with Goff, he had eight touchdowns like that yeah. one through 10. So a few weeks, one, two, three, five weeks, he went without scoring a touchdown in that, in those first 10 weeks, he sits wow. out week 11 versus the Browns comes back. And in four games, so he throws nine touchdowns. It took yeah. him 10 in the beginning of the season to throw eight. So he comes in, he throws nine touchdowns in four weeks. So there, you cannot de- deny, um, that Goff has really come on and found his rhythm. It's just, it will be awesome to see that with more pieces and healthy pieces um, once they finally start to to come back. So um, I think the foundation has been laid. I will get to talk to GM Brad Holmes next week. I am really excited to see what he has to say about the blueprint. I think uh, Holmes being able to watch Dan Campbell is a head coach and see how aggressive he is and, and how he coaches. Now he has a better blueprint for the players that they're going to want to scout and draft in this upcoming, this upcoming draft, which uh, is still going back and forth um, in terms of who people think the Lions are going to take for possibly a number two overall pick. So I'm very, I'm very interested to see how that shakes out. Yeah, I am too. And I think uh, part of me says the best, pass rusher on the board, but it's got to be somebody who warrants being the second pick overall too. We can't just take somebody who might be the 15th pick and see, but we really need him. No, you can't, you can't win that way. You can't, you can't try to force a player into a spot that he doesn't belong in. But I think there are a couple of, a couple of pass rushers out there that people really think are vying for the number one spot. I don't necessarily agree with that, mm-hmm. but there's a, there's a lot, lot of time to go in the developmental process of that when you think about this they've got the second pick overall the 34th pick overall which is the second pick of the second round and then wherever the los angeles rams end end up with plus they have the rams first round pick in 2023 you can use that use that as a bargaining chip if you want to nothing says you got to wait till 23 for it you sure you, know you might want to take a, a second round pick and that pick and move up to like number six or something like that or seven or this year and then you have the benefit of having that player on your roster for a year. Right. Development. Development. Because these lines, they are in a rebuild that has never been um, up for an argument. It's just, okay, you have a second overall pick. Yeah, maybe let's shift that 2023 pick here to the 2022 draft and get that rebuild going a little bit faster. Because right now, it seems like the rebuild is fast-tracked. And I don't – listen, listen, we're not homers. It's, it's what you're seeing on the field. They go in, they beat Arizona, a team that hadn't lost on the road. They finally clinch um, a last second win against Minnesota. Like this team is only a few points away from having five or six wins under their belt. It's just luck has not been on these Lions' side. But I think you can't deny that the rebuild has been fast tracked under head coach Dan Campbell. Well, yeah, I think it was six, eight weeks ago when Sheila, uh, Sheila Ford Hamp, once again, the principal owner, did an interview with one of the beat writers and she used the word, she came right out and said, this is a rebuild. And I'm glad she did it. You know, everybody was kind of hemming and hawing around that, you know, dreaded word rebuild. And no, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. And you had to come to grips with it. Now, certainly internally, they, they did come to grips with it. So they just didn't want to use it publicly, but it is what it is. And I think they're, look, you can always, you can keep putting patches on the same old tire and you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to put another patch on an old tire, and you're gonna have to do it again and again and again. Now, if you got a when you when you get a team that's ready to compete for uh, division titles and championships and all that, you can do something maybe that that to give up a, a, a future draft pick for a pass rusher who's got one or two years left. Uh, you can do that, but that's not the position the Detroit Lions are in. <clears throat> I've seen them over the years 
give up a draft pick for somebody on his last legs, and the next year they're in the same spot. And I, I think, I think Brad Holmes, uh, I think we, I, I think they whatever assets they had for team building going into it, I think they've used them wisely for the most part. Show your Lions pride by going authentic with gear from shop.detroitlions.com. For a great selection of t-shirts, hats, jerseys, and novelties with convenient flat rate shipping right to your doorstep, visit shop.detroitlions.com, your 24-7 home for Lions gear. A lot of good things are happening. And um, granted, yes, you want to see more wins in that win column for these Detroit Lions, but you cannot deny that a foundation has been laid, an identity has been grown, and there's a lot of excitement around this franchise as we head into the offseason. So with that, Mike O'Hara, I need your very last bet MGM pick of the game here for the last time this regular season. What you got? Well, you know, the Lions have been good against the point spread all year. They weren't, they weren't perfect. Obviously, last week they missed it by about 25 points, but things happened. And that was one of them. And things don't happen. I like the Lions to keep it close. I really do, uh, regardless of how long Aaron Rodgers plays, which I don't think it's going to be long. But I, I like them to keep it close. Once again, uh, give it the Green Bay Packers. I got to go with them. Okay. They're the, cl- the class of the NFC to pick against it would be ludicrous. Uh, 27 26, a one point game. 27 26. I do like that. I like those scores. Yeah, this will be interesting. I mean, you did pick Arizona to beat the lions and look how that played out so i i like i like when you pick us as the underdogs mike oh well, yeah well they are the underdog yeah i mean but you know some of us hold out a little more hope than others pick um, it up to cover cover the spread yeah just, just cover it just cover the spread they've been phenomenal just cover the put spread. your money put your money on the lions and and collect and, and we'll be friends again okay for mike o'hara i, I mean the ever wise mike o'hara detroit lions.com writer <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the, for honestly, just getting through this entire season with me. Uh, you did not sign up to do this podcast every week, but we appreciate you and you give great knowledge and a point of view, unlike any other. So we appreciate you helping us out every Friday. Um, I don't think your bet MGM picks have ever been right this season, but I'm sure they've mainly been close. Um, we'll have intern PJ look it up. We'll get back to you guys on that. But I, anyway, Mike, thank you so much. We, your, your work is so appreciated with the Lions. And, uh, I mean, let's do this all again. I mean, in the off season, I'm ready. Anytime you need me, you know where to find me. I don't have your address, but I will find it. You can text me. Okay. I'll text you for your address. Okay, cool. All right. Big thank you to Michael Harrow for joining us here on the one pride cast that wraps it up for the regular season. We will see you back in the off season.